Should be a pretty interesting discussion. Um, I'm Amy Mueller. I'm the uh, artistic director of Playwrights Foundation. I think I still am. And um, I would like to introduce Melly Katakalis, who will be is leading this panel. And 
that was a really interesting experience um, to start to be part of that process so early and have the playwright listen to us uh, through workshop, through laying on the floor, dreamlike state, talking about all these strange things. It was it was really really uh, fascinating for me, and um, the idea for the set actually came to us at the retreat. Um, so it came quite early, which doesn't always happen because the play it wasn't even done by any means. Um, but it, uh, it was a sort of a it was a musical, which is sort of the first time Ken Fire had ever done that either. Um, and you can see from it, it's in a tiny space, which is pretty typical often of new work or very very new work. Um, and I guess sort of the, there are certain principles, sort of rules, I don't know if they're really rules, but things that end up happening over and over again in a lot of the design work um, in plays that I found is that the uh, design often has to be open and somewhat simple and very, very flexible. Um, the play uh, is not always done when you have to make someone build it or when you have to design it or when you have to create your part of it. Uh, things aren't always in a completely finished state. So, working with that is a very different experience. Um, and so keeping it open and having a single person we can. Um, we, we sort of created a space where a lot of blocking was possible and a lot of possibilities existed. Um, and then the director uh, could explore those without too much impediment. But we didn't want the set to impede things. So it was sort of like an a larger environment for the play to kind of grow and change and evolve. Uh, even through preview. I mean, I've done shows where we completely cut big pieces of set and replace them like, during the last few years. So I've learned over time to try to accommodate that in an early stage so that it's not an impediment. Do you want to tell your story, Amy? <laughs> About the costume? Yeah, sure. Oh. Because you thought that was a. Yeah, well, we don't have a picture of it, I don't think. No. But, but we. Um... It actually might be on the Pride of Fire website. Mm -hmm. We so the costumes all came in and the characters were gods in the first act. Or there were god characters in all of the acts. The four, the four gods. Right. Yeah. And so they were each dressed in, you know, with with different uh, uh, eras in life. Mm -hmm. kind it was of a very that was another thing too, is that it, it was a certain mix mishmash of a lot of different types of mythology and to try to ground it we, we set it at quite a specific place in terms of it looking like a certain style but um, heightened it sort of like being specific while being general at the same time but that way the costumes were more defined I wish I had more pictures of yeah I think I think it's on their website we can show it later maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so one of the costumes came in and it was a whole bunch of layers of tool uh, but and the god was the god was kind of like a uh, she was a, like a um, I'm trying to think of the right word uh, a, a sadistic sex god uh, what is that called matrix dominatrix thank you Aaron <laughs> um, so. Uh, she was a dominatrix, and the, the tool kind of was covering her gorgeous long legs. And <laughs> around midnight or one o'clock in the morning, one night, I, I, I was like, guys, she just looks really awful because the tool is making her look really bad, and you know, you can't see her beautiful legs, and you know. And so it's, at some point, the costume designer was like, you know, you need to, you, I, I'm done, you know, I, I have to work on all this stuff. So uh, go, you know. I said, can I, can I take a pair? You know, can I? I'm going into this room with some scissors. <laughs> so the actress put the thing on, and I don't know. I had put myself into a state, and and we went into the room, and I, and I just started cutting like it was hair. <laughs> and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I, I really didn't. And it was. It looked great. It was amazing. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of times that we, when I do theater, when I design a show, that's not necessarily a new play, but you know, the statue, Shakespeare, whatever it is, of, of, a, of a known writer, and maybe people have seen this play in many different renditions, or whatever it is, we, the idea of, of creating a concept or imposing an idea upon a play is pretty common, and it happens all the time. 
Um, and then you're like, well, this is my idea, what I'm going to do with the play, and I'm going to do that play. And new plays are not at all about that at all. They're about having the person in the room who created the work. And maybe they, they're not always in the room with you, but it, it's, it's new enough to where you can have a conversation with that person and, and talk about it and, and really get to the heart of what, what's, what's happening. You're not, you're not putting an idea on top of another idea. You're just illuminating, which is a completely different experience, I think. Um, but there is that, in, that improvisation that happens. It's sort of like, it's not working, let's make it work. Um, my ne the next show uh, was uh, also by Liz Duffy Adams. So this is a very different circumstance where this is a play she had already written. Um, and so we weren't part of the development, or I wasn't part of that. Is it all okay? okay? Um, and uh, this is The Listener. It's a, sort of a post-apocalyptic world. Um, and again, it was really wonderful to have her around, even though the, the piece was already written, to be able to ask questions um, and have a relationship with her and establish that. And I think that's another part of playmaking that I, I really love and cherish and love as a designer is creating relationships with writers and having them last through more than one production and, and having, uh, I guess, certain, uh, I guess you could say even intimacy, just sort of knowing their language really well, already knowing an aesthetic that they have, um, and if mine matches, it's, you know, it's a partnership. It's, it's often like I keep working with the same directors, I keep working with the same writers. It becomes kind of a family in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of the ideas for this play came from like having lunch, having casual conversations, and you know what I mean? It wasn't formal meetings where we would sit down and come up with these brilliant ideas. It, it was it, cool it, for you to put, make, can you make this big, even though it doesn't yes. all fit? Maybe yes, yes, yes. Detail. Yeah, um, I wonder if this... That's F5. What's that? F5. Thank you. Um, and so there's a certain 
design aspect that will probably won't change. It feels like a cartoon. Um, but that was also the play was changing all the time. I also didn't quite know who to ask questions to. You know, you ask people as a group, as a whole, they don't agree, they agree. It was really a dynamic uh, experience, but really also a lot of fun to kind of learn the ins and outs of how to negotiate a kind of relationship. Um, and of course, I haven't spoken necessarily about the director, who is obviously a huge part of that relationship. Um, sometimes it's a new play, but you don't have access to the playwright all the time. So, that's the person sort of leading the charge, depending on your relationships. Um, the name of this play was uh, Eating It. Um, this is a play uh, called Archaeology by Rachel Axler. Um, and uh, the next one is uh, called Handbook Arm and Face by Matt Smart. And these were two plays that I did at UCSD when I was in graduate school. And, uh, that was sort of the next step, was to, to go to a place where lots of playwrights were all the time, so I could talk to them whenever I wanted to for the next three years. Um, you know, like that was a very big part of wanting to, to further my education and be part of a, a collective of people that uh, playwriting was at the center of my design experience in graduate school. Um, and so these were new plays that were being created at the time. I could talk to, if the playwright wanted to talk to me, they would talk to me as they were writing it, um, which did happen a couple of times, um, and very, very involved in the process, because they were still processing it. Um, and so this is part of the Baldwin and Play Festival. Um, this first one was called Archaeology. It was the idea of mining, uh, this woman sort of mining herself out of these holes that you see in the ground, like that sand. I've been sort of assembling herself after an earthquake, a medical earthquake, sort of uh, making discoveries about herself. And this play uh, was a retelling of the Romeo and Juliet story, um, which was really interesting, the idea of taking a, uh, a classic story that we all know and the retelling of it. Um, this is a Eurydice by Sarah Rule. I also did this at UCSD. Um, and it was a really interesting process. This is where I started to learn about the idea. Uh, the director came in and said, this hadn't been, this had only been done, I think, in one other place in the country. And I didn't play until I read it. Um, for the first time, I didn't know anything except that the play was written for me. <laughs> in a lot of ways. Such an amazing experience to feel so connected. And um, so, the director said, oh, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about what the play is about at all. We're going to solve certain uh, moments in the play, and that's how we will come to figure out the visual landscape of the play. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I was like, what are you talking about? I want to talk about what I think the play is about, and that's how we're going to come up with the design. And he said, no, 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 we have to, we have to discover what the play is, which was language I hadn't quite understood. And we were at a, an impasse for a while because we just, I felt like we were speaking two different languages. And I said, can we just call Sarah up? Can I just ask her some questions? <laughs> and, and he said, sure. And um, it, it went from phone calls to her actually coming to UCSD, which wasn't very far from where she was, and engaging in conversation with her. And that completely opened up the play for me uh, completely. Uh, it was so helpful to have her answer questions. And she didn't, you know, one of the big questions I asked her was, well, why is she, a, there's a, a theme in the play, if you don't know it, uh, of, of water, the river sticks, and she's always searching for this water source. And she's, you know, and I said, well, why is she always looking for water? What, what is that? She's like, well, you know, she's thirsty. And I thought, that, that okay. <laughs> but that really started a conversation with the idea of thirst and what does it mean to be thirsty. And in this play, how do you, in a metaphorical way, in a visual way, create uh, the landscape of the play about water that lives in the idea of water without ever having any water, um, creating that visual metaphor. And that's what we did for it. That sort of, that one question and that one answer just sparked the design process in a way that I think never, I know would never have happened otherwise. Just answering that question. Um, and so we have this wall of water bottles. They're, um, they're is it on uh, water cooler bottles. So you see the water cooler there. 
um, and they're on end. And she she has these amazing stage directions, which are impossible to actually uh, to accomplish in theater. A lot of the stage directions that Sarah Bull writes are like um, she falls down an enormous flight of stairs. Where there's a, they're, they're very fantastical and beautiful, and they're about the feeling of the moment. Um, and so that was the, the stage directions for when she falls into hell. Part of the play takes place on Earth, the rest takes place in the underworld. And she also says that the, the, the set doesn't change, which I thought was really challenging as well. Because the director's like, well, of course the set changes, but it doesn't change. And someone says to you, the set changes, but it doesn't change. You have to figure out what that really means. Um, and so I thought, well, what if, it, what if what's what we see on stage exists in a different way? So we've seen it one way, and then we'll just see it a different way. So that was the idea of the bottles. We see this wall of bottles, it's uh, earth, and then uh, they all fall down uh, in this big tidal wave, which was wonderful, because it looked like water, we didn't expect that at all. Um, and then they trudge through these bottles for the rest of the play. And like, what bigger hell is there? We <laughs> 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 would have to walk through these bottles. But it was it was this the, the physical the, the physical thing that it did to the the actors was really great in terms of having this obstacle this thing to try to get through is, uh, to get to this other person the play is very much about communication and, and uh, trying to say I love you and, and, and connecting with other people um, this is one of the last moments of the play where Orpheus is seen Eurydice and then he has to leave the underworld. And so at that moment of the play, there was this very huge light that illuminated um, Kind of illuminated everything in a way that I hadn't seen before. Um, and then this is another shot. Uh, so basically we have water without water. That was the idea of that. Um, I mean, that actually leads me to sort of the process that we're doing here. Uh, these uh, weeks that the art designers have been involved with the uh, playmaking process and the, uh, the, what the Playwrights Foundation does, which is allows the writers to, to do whatever they need to do with their writing for the next two weeks, for, for the two week period. Um, and our job as designers is to just talk with them and maybe give them some visual ideas of what we have, of how the play makes us feel. And um, I, I do this method, which I, I learned in graduate school, which I still do a lot. Uh, they're called the Cornell boxes. If you're, if you're not familiar with Joseph Cornell, you should sort of get familiar with him. You'd be familiar with him by looking at something like this, which is a sculpture made out of found objects. Um, and the reason I think, okay, okay, um, okay, <laughs> Cornell's under copyright. What do I do? There we go. Um, no, it's freaking out. I think it's just lost a signal. Is that what happened? It lost the signal? Yeah. That's bad. Okay. Well, I think I can talk about that printer box for a second. Um, and and it, it made a found objects, a sculptural thing, which is how we deal in uh, design for theater. We create uh, a sculptural landscape for the play, um, a visual landscape. Whether we're set designers, costume designers, sound designers, uh, light designers, it's all about that landscape, the world in which the play lives. Um, and so that's the reason I think the Cornell box works so well, because the objects are real. And when we deal with theater, we're certainly dealing with this other world, but it is a reflection of the real world. And so uh, there's some collage work up right now, which is sort of the first step of getting to the Cornell box. But it's the idea of collaging in 3D. Um, Um, which I think works very, very well as well. 
Um, this next show uh, was called The Bright River by Tim Barsky. This is an experience where I worked with uh, a writer who was also the performer in the play. Uh, and I have really experienced that before, where I would be going through a design process when the writer was present, but then present through the entire experience, including the performance. Um, and he, the way, it's also very individual how people work. Uh, he was really into putting things on the set himself, which I thought was really great. This is this set was sort of an assemblage. This is also a post-apocalyptic world. Um, it was an assemblage of a lot of uh, metal. Oh, I guess I don't have a picture of that. Um, where uh, it was sort of this junkyardy feeling, it was very sculptural. But he, when, as I was assembling it, he was a pretty integral part of creating the set with me, which I thought was wonderful. I loved that idea of having a partner in the creation of something. Um, this was also, um, this was an experience uh, of creating a play with a group of people as well. This is Leafy by Octavio Solis. Um, I did this play with him uh, with Cornerstone Theatre. Um, Cornerstone Theatre uh, is a professional theatre company that creates community-based theatre. Um, and the way in which we did this play is Octavio and I and other people went out to the community uh, in which the play was supposed to be going to be written and listen to the story circles. So this play is about um, uh, people at the end of their lives and their characters. Um, people who, uh, specifically, the play ended up uh, in a place of uh, people with dementia and Alzheimer's, um, who, whose memories are affected. And, um, and about people who love them, for them, love them and care for them. And so uh, the community was a very big part of the, the whole entire process including creating the play, writing the play. Uh, Octavio ultimately was the playwright, but they were involved in it from the beginning to the end, and then they joined the, the company of actors and performed the play. Um, and so having, going to story circles again was a very, I had never done that before, I had never seen sort of the evolution of how a play was created by listening to other people and then sort of documenting it, integrating it into uh, a piece of art. Um, the, the set, again, was uh, sort of an, environment, an environmental type of thing. Um, all the things that you see there is the giant racks of uh, photographs, framed photographs. These are framed photographs of everybody who was involved in the play. So every single photograph on that set was somebody that in the play knew. It was their family, it was them. Um, and that was a really, really deep connection that we felt like it was really, really important to create that on stage, to know that your environment, we, were, we had that deep connection to it. Um, and everybody participated. So it felt like I wasn't designing the set by myself. It felt like everybody was there with me. And then for moments of memory, some of the pictures lit up. We had them light up when um, the memory sequences were happening. Um, and it helped. So, you know, the set sort of helped create an understanding of what actually was happening in the play at that moment and um, sort of eliminated those moments. Um, and then this was another play I did with Octavia called Gibraltar um, at Thick House, <laughs> right here in this space. Um, and so the, by that time, I, had, I knew Octavia really well because we had done uh, the Cornerstone show. And so I already had a very like, shorthand with him. And this play had already been done at Morgan Shapes. And, um, I said, do you want to talk about the set from there? Because that's something you want to discuss. And he was like, no, no, no. Let's, let's you know, make our own play. And I thought that was an interesting experience of working with a writer who, whose play had already been done not very many times, one other time. But the idea of starting over or doing something new with that was really exciting. I felt I, mean, I had a little bit of a fear, like, well, you know, I'm going to have to do something somebody else has done. Uh, and so but I ended up looking very different, I think, from the but um, we created a, it's about Gibraltar and the play feels like it's very much on the boat. So that we sort of created, you can't see it because it's really big, but it, um, it felt very much like this thing was floating in, in space, in water, on this space. Um, um, this is Nero by Stephen Sater and Duncan Sheep. Um, I was, this is one of the first sort of musical things that I had done with writers. Um, again, it's, this is sort of the idea of sort of backstage at the 
characters, which is sort of how they wrote the play, but the director had a very big influence on the visual elements of the play. Um, she was very movement-based, and so when I read the play and heard the music, and then she sat down and talked about what she wanted to do, it was like totally different than what I thought when I read the play. Um, so it was interesting to have her point of view, and then what I thought was happening, and then the writers in the room. So it, it turned into this really interesting triangle of like, I don't know, like throwing the ball to each other and sort of picking it up and changing it. So there was a real evolution of, of what happened. And this is sort of what we settled on, which was, a, again, a really open space that had some specific elements, but uh, allowed for the possibility of things to happen. So we had this, this stair unit that moved around, and we saw the open space before. It's just a bunch of rugs and, and some doorways and the idea of being able to do really interesting movement. And I mean, that show changed literally all this time. I think it changed after it. Like, it never stayed the same. <laughs> um, and so you have to, I feel like, you know, as a designer, like I have to be prepared for the idea that they're going to completely cut a different piece or add another piece and then be prepared to be part of that discussion, you know? I mean, sometimes it's just not done. Um, and the idea of versatility, the reason I, I, I barely see that, but the reason I, I pulled this picture was also um, there are these chandeliers, and we didn't have, I, I was like, let's, I said, let's make them so that we can pull them down and up, not ever having an idea of what that would mean, but we did make the set very versatile, like movable and versatile, so that we could pick stuff up and move it if we needed to. And it ended up for the fire, during the fire sequence, that all the chandeliers came down, and that was how we created our fire. And we didn't know that at all, until we were like in the room, she hadn't figured that part out yet, and then we were, oh, she was like, oh, did the chandeliers come down? And I was like, thank you, they do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to do that part. So, fun moment. This is in the same exact space an hour later. Um, this is for a new play festival called Hot House at the Magic Theater. Um, and so, again, very open space, being very flexible. Uh, this, is, this play was about three different people. This is Morbidity and Mortality by Courtney Barron. Um, the idea of being able to be very versatile uh, with your three actors on stage and move them around. And, but still have it, if you look at the second picture, I mean, the design looks pretty different. The, I mean, the lighting designer is crucial, I think, anyway. But in, in terms of, of having that difference, if your, if your scenery doesn't really change, having the ability to really change the mood and the um, This is Aaron's play. Um, oh. First person shooter uh, that I did. Uh, we did at the uh, SF Playhouse. This is the model. Um, the reason I want to show the model is because it's almost impossible to get a picture of the entire set in that space <laughs> at all. It's so like intensely small. Um, but his play is about um, video games, if you, if you want the one word of <laughs> what it is. And um, there was a lot of projection that had to be uh, shown for the show. And uh, it's a challenging space in which to do that. But I also felt this very claustrophobic feeling of play. There's this feeling of entrapment all the time. There's this presence of feeling in the cage, which is kind of where I went with that. Uh, but also this sort of feeling of a blank slate that you can make it anything you want, which is what it is, because the video games really did color the set in a really interesting way. Um, there he is playing with. And then here, it's more environmental. Here's not about the video games, it's about the environment of the show. Um, Aaron, do you want to say anything about that? Because like, we started having a discussion about it at, at lunch or something during the retreat. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know like, how you felt. Like, yeah, I know you liked the set. But you said you had this different, and you can come down and talk about it. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the. Oh. Sorry. Too late. No, it's fine. Uh, so this, was my, this was my first. Serious professional production, and uh, oh, it was. Um, I had uh, done a full play in the Crown of Fire uh, in the Matchbox series before that, right, to buy, you know, a million years ago. But this was you know, first time with equity actors, the whole thing. And I sort of, um, I grew up reading plays where the playwright was quite prescriptive about the set. 
right? You know, in Tennessee Williams is like, there will be a script, and this will be that, and this, there's this room here, and there's this wall here, and, you know. Uh, and there's a telephone. There's a telephone. And, and there's know. rhyme on the telephone. Exactly. And, and Ibsen does the same thing. And, you know, you, you, you change Ibsen's set and any of his, his uh, where somebody exits at your own peril, right? If you're directing Ibsen, he's, he's, he actually sat for a year in the floors planning where every character is at every moment, <laughs> whether they're on stage or off stage, so you don't change any of it. Uh, so, you know, I always had that kind of, like, as a playwright, it was my responsibility to design the set for somebody, to know the physical space. So this was a play that I had said, you know, there will be a shadow screen, there will be this. I don't even remember what you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and so this was very different from what I had uh, written, and I think it was... It was oh, so I ignored it completely? You, you ignored it completely at, I believe, the much, much the improvement of the play. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that what I what I said in the description was that all this stuff that was going to happen was going to happen in shadows projections. Oh, right. Right, characters be behind a shadow screen. I remember in development, I mean, you were actually saying to me, like, yeah, I've seen countless people try to do that. It's always terrible. It never works. It never works. I was like, no, I, I believe it could work. That's great. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were absolutely like, you don't, don't, you don't want to do that. But, uh, and so this idea of using uh, video projections enabled us to suddenly have all the various places in place set in uh, uh, Illinois, it's set up heat in Silicon Valley, it's set, uh, there's a, a scene in a hotel, a scene in, in um, uh, a news studio, right? And because of the projections, we were able to make all of those things possible. Uh, it was really satisfying, and we were also able to work on these projections of the game itself, right. uh, where we, we co coworkers created a unique video game okay. environment yeah. and, and, and captured video footage of that environment for the game. So it, was, it, it made a bunch of stuff possible that would not have been possible mm -hmm. if you Did that change the way you write stage directions? It changed the way I write stage directions, also the way I changed so the most, uh, the thing that's most interesting about it, it changed the way I thought about that play. So then that set, set you designed then became the set that I play in my head for a while, right? And so right. then I, when the play was done, my other people were like, well, where's the video projections? Oh, so, <laughs> so, so it wasn't necessarily done then the same way again? No, no. So, so, so one production, they tried to actually do shadow screens that suggested, yeah. and, and that was hard. And, you know, it was well. <laughs> in other words, in an even smaller space, they did something very different. Yeah. So, Um, I think this would be a good time for other playwrights to come down. And sort of shift the conversation to, um, I guess, to, to you guys as well. <laughs> um, in terms of design, like how, you know, how do you think of design? Do you not think of it? How do you think of it? You know, in terms of, you know, have, have there been moments like what you just described that sort of change the way you thought of things? Does it change all the time? You know? I mean, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I, I love talking to designers because I, I, my, my visual mind goes part of the way and then it kind of caps out. My visual imagination kind of caps out because I'm such a ordered person. Right. <laughs> um, what and you guys, it, we, you should probably introduce them. Oh, I'm we sorry. Have, we have people uh, watching. Right, we actually okay, got a tweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron Lowe, who um, wrote uh, Ideation. Um, Aditi, so I'm sorry. Kapil. Kapil. Romani. Uh, I'm Lauren Yee, I wrote Samsara. Uh, I'm Gordon Dahlquist, I wrote Tea Party. And George Brandt, Grounded. So anyway, um, I, I wrote this one play where I had a character turn into a bird, um, and I, because I love talking to designers, I ended up refraining from trying to micromanage how in the world that was going to happen. And that's, I think that's been the beauty of that play, is it's never been the same twice. Right. And it's always been true to whatever that production is, which is kind of what it needs to be. Um, and I, I am inevitably surprised by what weird microscopic choices were made in the moment, three dimension, in the space, using a combination of sound or visual. Like, well, however they ended up doing it, that if I had tried to write it, I could not, you know what, I would yeah. shut that down. Right, 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 you know? I mean, when I get a stage direction like that, 
or you know somebody turns into a bird. That's one of the most exciting things I can read. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then there's all this possibility of what that is, and it just gets you into you know deeper into the play. You know what I mean? Like it keeps the the opening it opens it up so much, which is so great for me to know because as a writer who likes metaphor quite a bit, um, it's it's wonderful to be able to create metaphor and then trust that the theatricality will take it the rest of the way. Sure. To just let you play within that as well as in the mm -hmm. I, I think for me, like my relationships with designers like help me to kind of see what kind of player I am. Like, I think in looking at the sets that have been designed for my plays, uh, my work calls for a lot of like surprises and kind of quick cuts. Um, and I feel like the most successful sets that I've had have kind of built in the abilities to like reveal things quickly and close it up, or like characters can come out of you know the ground and go back. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the flexibility that you were talking about in terms of sets, um, I thought really resonated with the, with the pieces that I've worked on. Um, and so yeah, there are those impossible things that if you try to map it out very carefully in the play, it just would not work. Um, I think the thing that's interesting, we were actually talking about this immediately and I this morning, um, is the way that most playwrights now are not writing for any space. Do you know? I mean, historically, that's playwrights knew they had a company or they had a circumstance and they consciously or unconsciously, I mean, if you read Strindberg, there are really specific stage directions that are all about the thing on that door and the thing on that door because it's its theater. And so, for me, it's really a question of writing really specifically to the, the action, that the, the, the room that the, the action takes place in, but not the room that the play takes place in. Because I, I have no idea what that room is. So I, I guess I'm looking, you know, in a design, I'm looking for something that can connect those two things because uh, you know, the, the, the play is, has, you know, unfortunately, usually, an abstract relationship to where it's going to end up, you know, and that, and, and that is totally going to change things. So I want something to sense into that. Yeah, I think my uh, place, I don't have much, increasingly less and less stage directions and scenic descriptions. Um, however, while I'm, while I'm writing, I definitely have a pretty realistic, uh, like if, if it's two people talking in a room, I, I see that room in realistic terms, kind of more three-dimensional, sure. 360. So uh, that is always a jarring moment when it is brought out of that uh, world into our world <laughs> by a set designer, uh, in which, as you say, maybe the scene needs to change. You know, like I mean, there's place. You know, we have multiple locations, but each one of those locations, while I'm writing it, is fully fleshed out. You know, if there's a bookcase, it's filled with books. Right. Um, and obviously when you get into the real world and you've got to change between uh, five locations, each of those locations can't be uh, fully realized. Um, and that's always a bit of a jarring moment. Um, it takes a little getting used to that, oh, okay, that, that room is now just a table. <laughs> okay, all right then. <laughs> um, uh, maybe there's a glass on the table. Um, but, uh, and, that, and that the mind then fills in a divided audience fills in everything that was there, hopefully, in your own. Um, but yeah, that, but that's always jarring. Every once in a while, uh, you get that fully like realistic set that was a little closer to what's in your head. And, um, and that's a different, different matter as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that happens a lot where um, there are multiple locations. Um, that would be, you know, if you were making the film version of it, there would be no issue, you would just make the film. But, you know, my, in my mind, I'm like, well, we're not making the film, we're doing theater. So it actually forces me to think about the world of the play, as opposed to where the location of the play, which I think is more interesting, you know, because then you start to ask yourself questions about the, the sort of the, the touchy feely questions that we were, we were sort of exploring at, at uh, the retreat of how does this place smell? How does it taste? How does it feel? You know, is it gritty? Like those more visceral qualities of play, which uh, you know, as a designer, are much meatier than 
you know, are they in the kitchen? <laughs> or, you know, where are they exactly? Um, of course, they're still in the kitchen, but then what is that, the shell, what is the sort of envelope that the play is in uh, can be answered and sort of, and, and I think it also serves, it serves the play to maybe have that be present all the time, no matter where the location of the play may be, that there's this presence around it, no matter where we are all the time, kind of maybe reminding us or grounding us into the, the world of, of, of play. Um, not um, it's, it's interesting. You said you, um, you you picture the room of the play. So you you do picture it that. Has, do some of you? I mean, I don't know. It's interesting. Can you look at? I mean, when I say I picture the room, it's really about for that for a piece of dialogue to make sense. I know that this person is about five feet from that person. Oh, do you know proximity what? and proximity and. and yeah, I mean, like a you know, a silence between two people means something if they're sitting at the table, and it means something if that someone is standing at the door. Right. So that's a really, you know, like that for dialogue not to be abstract. I mean, it's dialogue and not one person talking. It's a, uh, you know, those kinds of things have to be really palpable. I mean, in the same way that you know, time is really palpable. You know, you know how long something takes. Um, so for me, yeah, it's 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 that kind of room, and then and then design is. Yeah, it's a totally other uh, element that's crucial to that, but it's more of those. I mean... Is it like spatial relationships are the same? Yeah, Not yeah. like, this room has to be this big No, room. no. I mean, I think, we've, I'm sure we've all had circumstances where a, a set for a play is completely radical, radically different in two different productions, and they're all perfectly, they can each be perfectly wonderful, but, yeah, you don't, all the solutions don't have the same answer, but they have the same I think, like, I do the same thing. I completely picture something specific, but it's not immutable. It's just specific because you have to have, I, I need to have some kind of clarity in my mind as to the relationship and the circumstances of the character so they can have some kind of emotional core truth so they can have a conversation. Um, like, there's this, probably the same play, um, where it's just so important for me to know in my brain that these two train drivers are standing in a very small space because they're in a train that is hurtling forward and they're in a small enough space that they can't face each other, they're just facing forward and they're having a conversation. This is really important to me to know. Now whether you put them in a box or just have them stand there, could care less. Do you know what I mean? It's, but it's important to me to know that that's the quality of their proximity, that's the quality of their, you can't really look directly at you because I'm busy looking that way. That's really important to me to know for, for them to talk in that time, in that space. I think it's actually really similar to when, in a play, you, you know, you have a transition and it's just like a pause or a silence or something. And, you know, I think most playwrights have a very good sense of what happens in that. But you don't write silence, Barbara questions her childhood. Because you're not, that's for the actor to do, do you know? So the actor will get from one side or the other to that moment. And you just have to say there's a moment, you know. And I think design, I mean, design functions in a really similar way. Like you set a you set a circumstance, but if we're telling the designer what to do, then we're trying to do a job that we're not actually, you know, trained to do. I think, and it ends up great. Yeah, that kind of leads to my next question, which is how involved are you with design, or you know, is it is it always the same? Is it different? Tends to be whether you're in that city or not, sure, and like whether you're actually at rehearsals. Um, I get, I get like in my experience, I've kind of like used the director as a conduit to yeah. like communicate with designers so that like they're not kind of getting the director's vision versus the playwrights. Um, I think like I I tended to like step back just because I am not kind of a director oriented. Like I don't know how to block things or what the movement's supposed to look like. Like I imagine the very specific room, but I have no idea how much space they're gonna need and those types of things. So I I can just stay that. I guess in the premieres I tend to be involved just because I'm there actually. I mean otherwise it's a, it's a visual medium. It's very hard to be involved if you're not physically yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I like I feel like when you're in a premiere process and the play is still sort of finding its first 
production personality kind of thing. There is a back and forth usually. Um, and, uh, oh wow, yeah, I'm going to now adjust this moment because I didn't know that was possible. Who knew you could give me that? You know what I mean? So for premieres, for sure. And then that's usually the only one that I'm consistent right. to do that. Okay, because you, you're sort of at the moment, your play's done. You've done ish, right? Like, you know, you've written it. <laughs> um, I'm always done. <laughs> done ish is good. <laughs> um, so you're at a point where it's no longer developed. So now you produce. Um, have any of you had involvement in designers before a production, before that moment? Was that? Um, when I was workshopping Agnes Under the Big Top, um, which is a play that went through a very large and complex development uh, process, um, it, it was uh, it was one of those uh, new play development projects that the NEA was funding through the stage, and so we had this really interesting particular journey where certain stages were more about text, certain stages were more about Bulgarian clowns. You know, like that, and we had one stage which was at Interact Theater in Philadelphia that was about talking to designers. And they acquired, for my amusement, a set designer and a sound designer. I can't believe I'm not going to um, Anyway, so um, it, it was a stop where we would read the draft of the play, and I hung out, and they, they had all read the play, and we hung out for about two hours just brainstorming about what the world of the play might look like. Um, it was really fun, and I ended up with some kind of amazing sketches that were made on the fly, and I was like, wow, and I got to keep them. Um, and that was fabulous. Um, the play was not finished, so it was like an interesting combination of, ooh, I can use that mm -hmm. thought, and no, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, it was a little bit of both like that, like we had a debate about windows and which way it's okay to orient them on stage. <laughs> it was, and it got kind of intense because it was like, no, a window, and they're like, you know, have strong opinions that are really like kind in of general, general. Like what way to do that? The interesting thing about it is the play is still morphing, and most designers work on things when they're not still morphing. Sure. Yeah. So there's uh, like there were things where I was like, oh, holy crap! And every single production since that conversation has had the pole that you can hold on the subway. And that came out of that conversation, and I was like, I am never letting go of that. That is the best thing I've ever heard. And so that's great. That's an amazing thing. Um, but then the other side of that, when you're, the other side of that for me was that I had written a window into the play, which I saw the actor looking out and launching the audience. And that was important to me metaphorically. And the feeling in the room was that, no, if you want to create more space, the window has to go upstairs. The actor. And so we had a long debate about windows, and I walked out of that debate going, no, you're wrong. And no production has ever gone upstage. It's always been, you know, that's that's the thing. So it was a fun riveting session. It was a fun, like, play session. Um, and I got a, a couple of really great things, and I got a couple of, no, nah, I'm not going to use that. And that was great. Also, I mean, maybe maybe the, the great thing about the window is that you really knew that you were right. You know what I mean? Like, you really, maybe it solidified yeah. your conviction of, you know what, now I really know I'm right. Oh, I've talked really, about yeah. it for hours on end. Yeah. Like now I know that I really I, fought for that. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, you know, it's your play. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. there's something about that of like, well, now that I've debated it to death, I totally know that I'm just, that's exactly right. You know, that I have no that's doubt true. whatsoever that that's Because it had never crossed my mind before to debate the window because I had never thought anyone would ever point it upstairs. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I have a window. <laughs> well, recent, recent, <laughs> windows of discovery, actually with two recent plays, that yeah, where that window is, and if it exists at all, as you uh -huh. say, they're just looking, you know, oh, yeah. out. Uh, yeah, I had a play, The Mourner's Bench, that was just a Trinity Rep, and the set called for a few things, but where those things would be was debated quite a bit. Um, there's a baby grand piano that we're told is sitting in the bay window of this house, but the third act, uh, the woman is spending all her time sitting at the piano, staring out the window, um, and figuring out how that was possible, and whether we wanted to have her facing upstage for, you know, a half hour, as you're saying, you know, okay, that's not really real estate, so where we've got to turn this piano, like what angle the piano was going to be at, and, and where 
it ended up moving into a little more, uh, not abstract, but extended reality, let's say, as the bay window was, was pretty far away from her on the piano. Um, uh, but they put a little window seat, you know, on the edge of the stage to kind of help us with that. I mean, the piano was pretty far back, but the seat was there, so there was still a window <laughs> out there. But we spent a lot of time, the set designer and the director and I, just wrestling with where you just needed a staircase, a piece of wall, a piano, and a window. And uh, I thought that that was simple. And yeah, discovered that it was not. I was going to say, so the realities of production sort of, once it's like shown back to you, you're like, oh, uh -huh. oh. Maybe I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. <laughs> that then now that we put it on stage, it actually with people and furniture and stuff, that it's this different thing that maybe in your head. I've had I had a crazy realities of production production experience with uh, this play that I wrote that, that can that is three acts and you ask me to perform in any order. And uh, I you know, grew up doing theater in small theaters where somebody's in a light board changing stuff, so you know, it's not, not a big deal, right? <laughs> and uh, so the first, you know, the first production meeting is like, because I was like, are you, are you out of your mind? And they're like, okay, so I have pro I program out the whole show, and so the fact that you want this to be able to be done in any order, I'm going to have to be able to have like, I don't know, nine different programs or something that will run, or we don't even know how we're going to do this, but we'll stop the whole show and reprogram the board in order to do the act based on, so they, have, they eventually figured it out. But they did, though, right? They did, they figured because it out. Because that, that, to me, I mean, that's hard, but it should be done. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's a hard thing to do, but that's, there are certain things you honor, right? When you write a play, you're writing a play, so, you know what I mean? And, so and things been, that are challenges are challenges, but they, they are, if, if they don't, if they are, they don't defy the laws of physics. You can do them. <laughs> yes. And so some people you know? who used to play, they, they do, they, they, they rig one of the acts. Mm -hmm. so it's like the first two they can count on, or so they're like, you know, they, they, or the first one they can count on because that makes it easier for them. Uh, but um, yeah, it turns out that the technology had moved to a point based on an assumption of linearity of theater that it made it extremely difficult for theater <laughs> designers to be able to figure out how to do something that was not mine. Right. And, and so we had sort of relearned some skills that they have and, and they used to find more stuff over there. Okay. Now I'm just realizing that I did, as you're talking about, I, it's interesting what, what like problems are yours and what are the designers and that whole thing. I was remembering that people were like, well, that's not your problem, that's not your problem about the window. But now I'm remembering I did have one thing that was my problem, which is there were drapes, uh, there were supposed to be drapes on the window <laughs> that are cold at one point, and that was kind of important. <laughs> So it became a choice of, yeah, either drapes or downstage window, <laughs> um, because we could not have imaginary drapes on an imaginary window. Um, so the drapes, the drapes, the drapes hit the road. And I was like, oh, okay, I, I have a question. How important are the drapes? <laughs> uh, so we decided. How do you feel about mine? How do you feel about did mine, you, yeah. did you, Well, did you solve that problem in a different way, that moment in a different way? Did you get the moment that you needed without the drapes? Yes, but, but it did it did require uh, just a tinge of rewriting. Because uh, he was, I mean, she's staring out the window at something and her husband closes the drapes, which is a pretty big yeah. action in the play. So without that, uh, yeah, we needed to replace it with something else. Um, so yeah, so that, that, that was a required rewrite. Which, and then you kind of wonder, what deal do I leave that in the script? Are the drapes still gone? Or could yeah. someone else solve this? <laughs> uh, but the drapes are gone. Uh, I decided that no one else could solve this problem that I created. I also, I also find that like designers are also in charge of a lot of like how much is kind of highlighted for an audience, or how much is like foreground. Like I had a play that was like actually performed in this huge, huge space, um, and it just so happened that the way the set was designed was that most of the action happened on this small little platform, and so it was actually like it actually we had to like re-block everything and reconceive it all because like most of it happened like we couldn't fit everything in the little island that had kind of been designed. Like I realized halfway through. 
that not all the spaces in my play were as important as the others. Mm -hmm. um, that I had, I had imagined like, oh, you know, we have like say five different locations, um, you know, and it's kind of spread out. And I realized that no, like 70% of the play happens on the small little part of the stage. Um, so that, that was kind of like an education. Um, Did you feel you needed to make that space bigger when you realized that, or, or was the size? I, 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 think, I think I guess I wished, I realized that that was like the center of the play, that was the center of our universe, and that we should have taken it and put it in the center and kind of made it a little bigger. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, like there, there are certain, there are certain also roadblocks sometimes when um, I feel like the design isn't linked up to the writing. But do you think, not that you have to solve this, I mean, what are your thoughts about how that could be? Like, what, do you think in those circumstances that you're thinking that maybe could be done, what would you learn? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if like, the designer, the director, and I have, like, all thought about it a little more, um, and really evaluated, like, what are the really important actions? Is it the opening of drapes? Is it that we're in this particular room? Like, if we'd actually gone out and charted the whole play, seen that yes, most of the action occurs in this one room rather than all these kind of you know extra spaces. I think we might have we might have solved that a little earlier. Yeah, I mean I I, I designed myself a two a corner. It reminds me yeah. of the times where I feel like I've designed myself a two corner because you too specific with the designs. Which I think it's a very general thing to say. <laughs> you know, the, the creating something that's so specific that there's no room for expansion or contraction is fair. It's like yeah. not a good idea <laughs> with a new play because if it's a new play to everybody, including the writer, you are going to discover something about it that you didn't know by the end of producing it. It's one thing to write it and then talk about it, have all these great ideas and plan for it, but then for making it happen and changing the drapes or like moving the center of the play, like those things. You have to hopefully have some sort of plan ahead of time, knowing that that might happen, and create. You know, and, and you do come up with a different design than maybe you would have otherwise. But you know, your purpose as a designer, my purpose as a designer, is to serve, serve the play. Serve, the, you know, it's about play. So that's what it means. It's what it means. It's not. It's about that. Just interesting. It's not about serving a person, or you know, it, we, we think of it in a very Maybe people think they need to work? I don't know. Um, yes, can I was going to say, say a yeah. question. Could you say more about your time in UCSD when you said that you were actually working with playwrights who were creating the play in real time? And well, in real time, in terms of that, I was in school for three years with these people. They were my classmates, or you know, or a year ahead or behind me, or whatever. And um, often writing them, sometimes at the time that we were in school, I would, you know, what are you doing? Are you playing? about and might design it, you know? And so there were lots of discussions where, you know, some people who were wanted to talk about it were really vocal about it, what they were working on and wanted to talk about it with me, which I was never, I was like, wow, really? You know, and I have, I mean, I have friends, lots of friends who are playwrights who call me and, you know, I've had people email me scripts and be like, you know, I was really worried about it in this part of the play, like, do you think we can do that? Like, as a set designer, do you think that's okay? And almost nine times out of ten, I go, it doesn't matter what I think. In a way, you know, you should just write it. And then when you get it to somebody who's really going to make the play, then talk about it, because you, you shouldn't have to worry about that right now. I, I really don't think you should. I, like, that's my own opinion, but that's not, uh, I can react to the play and tell you how I feel about it and what I think about the play, but in terms of, like, a specific moment, do you think, that physically this is possible or whatever is irrelevant at the top at the time that someone's writing a play, I think, because that will interfere with whatever you're doing as creating a piece, a piece of art, creating a work. Um, that physical impossibilities are irrelevant. They should be anyway. Like in theater, I don't know. I don't. Realistically, for many writers, well, it has to interfere. Like, right. The producibility of the play. Okay. Right. Whether or not I know I'm in mean, like this wonderful world, well, no, I mean, but I, I, we all want to be in that world. I guess I guess it depends on which stage you're you're at. If you're done with the play, you're like okay, now read it. 
but I've also had things where you know, I've been sent this bizarre like, group of pages that I don't understand. <laughs> so that, <laughs> I was supposed to make a judgment, and I don't want to do that. But that's exactly my question, though, because it sounds like what's being really interesting here is people talking and designing earlier, you know, collaborating earlier, and you're talking about this old model of serving the play when it's done. But we're well, talking a lot about like yes. playwrights trying to figure out what the play is that's being trying to be served. And I'm I, curious about yeah. how designers are helping playwrights find what play that is that should be mm -hmm. served. And I, I want to yes. hear more about it. Well, I think, yeah. I think those are two different things. I'm learning that, like right now, <laughs> like, like in the last two weeks, right? That, and I sort of knew it, but so we are talking, what we've been talking about the last few minutes is about a production process. So the play is already written. It's going to change because it hasn't ever been produced before, so there is a, an element of something's going to happen and change, and, and, and there'll be an evolution. Um, but it's a lot different, and, and, and you know, your plays right now, in the workshops are in different stages of finished and unfinished. They're, they're all over the place. Um, I wanted to come and start the new play design lab, which is what we're doing during this festival, to um, create a relationship between the designers and the writers that either doesn't exist very much ever, or, or and or just um, add another voice to the development process that isn't always there. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But to see, you know, what is that like when you add another voice to the room and that voice has a visual mind and thinks of the play in a really different way than a dramaturg does, than a director does, than an actor does. Um, and so it's the idea of just adding a voice in and seeing if that helps. It's as simple as that. So it's not at all about practicality, or I don't, or, or maybe it is if that question is asked, if that's what's going to help the play. But I think it's more about uh, the, d the development part of it, not the production part of it. So um, that's why I, 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 you know, I brought these ideas, and maybe they work, and maybe they don't. The idea of creating collage. The idea of creating a visual uh, idea of what the play might be and uh, doing the 3D collage, but not going any further than that, not being prescriptive at all about what things should look like at this point, because maybe that's not what the play needs. Maybe some of these plays do want that. Maybe that is their next step. But in this in this moment, um, just adding a, a visual voice to that conversation and enriching the experiences of, for, the, for the writers. It's, oh, I think that's great. Yeah. Big idea. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. I kind of want to challenge this idea of producibility. You said what? I'd like to challenge the idea of producibility. Yes. Um, because I, I don't understand. I don't know what that word means. Producibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what it means. Well, uh, okay. Let's, yeah. let's, let's engage. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I have a friend who doesn't write plays anymore he wrote a play and the set that they used had a staircase and the dance numbers were too complicated and on, on uh, critic review night the actor tripped on the stairs and hurt, uh, like pulled his hamstring and continued to dance through the night and the times panned it and the times didn't say boy that set was too treacherous the times said he's an awful writer and so he stopped writing plays and he that's one reaction that artists have to the fact that they're just their ass is out in the wind when they write, when they write something that's too complicated. So some some writers, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do. I'm saying that playwrights do think about producibility. They think about okay, is this am I asking for a set that will cost a million dollars? And if I am, will anybody ever produce it? Or am I asking for something to happen that will be so complicated that the odds of me being humiliated? Are very good. In which case, maybe I shouldn't do that because you know the, the people who really like stick their neck out there to be really humiliated by the press are actors and, and playwrights. I mean, we're really good right. in the neck. So I, I think playwrights do sometimes have to think about that. Uh, or not. I admire. I I still don't. Like I still like yeah. just do this crazy stuff. Like hey, yeah, do it in any order. Let's see what happens. <laughs> and many many writers don't. But you really are taking a risk when you. There's certainly a thought that maybe you should be more conservative. So, so what you're but what you're saying is, I mean, I, I feel very badly for this playwright. So, you know that that sounds horrible, but it sounds like the director and or the choreographer and or the scenic designer actually did this this playwright 
a bad turn. It wasn't that it was too complicated or the fact that it had a staircase. There are many staircases on stage. It was, it was not done in a way that was doable. So, you know, so, so, so you're for instance, I mean, I think failure. what, if, if you look at, I think my, 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 the reason that I don't uh, understand that word, usability, is because if you go around to the theaters in San Francisco, if you came to the Thick House and, and you would probably, at, at, at a certain level, you would say, how the hell could you produce anything <laughs> in here? Yeah. <laughs> and make magic happen. Okay. But we saw this slide of Melly's, you know, production of, of um, Gibraltar. Gibraltar, which I saw, and the space looked completely, it was transformed. It looked completely different. I saw three of Octavio's, two of Octavio's plays here, utterly different from one another. Magic definitely occurred in, in I don't know what this is, like 14 by 18. So and and that those plays, right but, and then it was done. Uh, it was done at uh, just like an Oregon Shakes, right? A huge space with millions of dollars. You know, I don't know how much there. A hundred thousand dollars per production. Two hundred thousand. You know, half a million, right? The same play done for what twenty thousand dollars or whatever. So the idea that the playwright is responsible for the producibility of a play, to me, is bullshit. Because it, it's the producer who's responsible. The, the producer won't, I mean, we, we can talk about it from a perspective of art, we can talk about it from a perspective of reality, the two don't always meet, and it's, you know, I mean, right, I, but how are I you can sit here and pretend like that? I agree, and like, oh, of course. No, they, no but how are you, but my question is, Aaron, how are you, are you, any of you responsible for the producibility of your play when you don't know how much your budget is, right. what theater you're going to have it in, what those elements, I mean, a waterfall in one, in, on a Broadway show is going to be totally different from a waterfall in a Crowded Fire show. Yeah. And Crowded Fire is responsible for saying, hey, we want to do this play and we need to figure out how to do the waterfall because we have a $20,000 budget. And so we're gonna we're gonna use ingenuity to make that happen and produce your play. I mean, who knew that Crowded Fire could produce uh, good goods? I mean, that, talk about it impossible to produce play, especially at the Boxcar Theater, and it worked beautifully in there because the producer figured it out, not the playwright. That's, I think, what I would love to hear you talk a little, little bit about, and you guys, too. Like, like what, what is your responsibility around creating something producible, and how can you second guess that? Well, there, there's a side angle to this. Maybe I shouldn't even pick up, but I think for playwrights, like, the, the more concrete example of that kind of thing is cast size. Do you know, like, like, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of expense of, you know, there everyone, I think, I'm sure, has run into theaters where design is maybe a flexible expense because the design is a flexible solution, but the difference between paying six equity actors versus five equity actors is a definite budget item, and that constricts what we're doing. I, to me, I think where and how design constricts is more a sense of, it's like a, it's like a weird sense of self-selection. You know, like different theaters will do different kinds of designs or will see a play if it's a fairly realistic, realistic play that might ask for three different fairly realistic sets. If you're an Oregon Shakespeare, then you know that's gonna revolve in and every single knickknack is gonna be, you know, bought from pottery barn. Um, uh. but uh, but someone else, you know. And there will be a theater that says, oh, no, no, we can do this totally creatively with light or with something, but there will be a theater that says, we actually have a realistic vision of theater, and we can't do three sets. And that theater isn't going to say, right. we'll do a waterfall with my law. Right. You know? So I think it, it, it's, a, it's, not the, it's not the conversations you have, it's the conversations that, that you don't have, I guess. So that, that to me is 
my sense of what Aaron's talking yeah, about. That, that is, so the cast size and, and, and that kind of stuff, the, the number of sets, are, are the more common stuff that I I'm totally, I think, parents have to grapple with in some sense. If, if there's some place you want to introduce, you want to think about that. I, I, I just know often, I've had conversations with other writers who've looked at a script of mine and said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> the, the, the chance of this being done in a way that won't humiliate you is very, very tiny. Right? From, a design, and, and, from a design? From, from a design and production. Like, asking somebody to do a play in three acts in any order is an incredibly hard thing to ask a theater to do, right? right. Uh, you know, what uh, Jake Brahman is a very hard play to do, right? Like, in a week, clearly this group, your play, very hard to do. <laughs> we like to do actually, actually when you do hard stuff, self. right? And and so there's some sense that you start to think about, well, should I or could I endure myself from that particular risk? Should I should I mitigate risk to the play by asking for something a little simpler or not? And then once every my name is Sarah Rule, then I can start asking for okay. waterfalls. But then does doing that make the concept you had originally for the play redundant. Yeah, Do you exactly. know what I mean? No, like, then why? Because my, I guess my solution is, I, yeah, I know that universe exists where you know I'm not going to get produced because of what I wrote. But I, I just kind of, the responsibility for the producibility that I have is I have a play that is very hard to produce, but you can't tell when you read it. It's called Love Person. It's um, it's bilingual in ASL and English. You have to have a deaf actor. You have to have an incredibly high level ASL proficient actor. You have to have a South Asian. You have to have technology. You have to be able to cue both deaf and hearing actors during the Tech is a nightmare. You need a sign master to translate the script. People read this play and they think, oh, what a nice four person chamber piece. <laughs> so I actually, the responsibility that I take for that play is if I happen to know of a, if I'm contacted, which I'm not necessarily, it's a publisher, but if I'm contacted about it, I explain how hard it is <laughs> because huge risk of you know horrible things happening and then they hate me and then they never want to produce me again. But it, like I actually almost spend time dissuading them or at least making sure that they realize that we're talking sign master your first week of rehearsal you can't read through the play because half of your cast doesn't have their script yet. That's not something you can anticipate if you don't know. So I have like a two page thing where I'm like here are my warnings. Now do with that what you will. <laughs> and that's my responsibility to that play. Because yeah. it is actually almost unproducible, but no one gets it until they're like halfway through and they're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I guess my, another question I would have here, because I, I totally get what you're talking about, because maybe what you're really saying is, if I want to have a play at this level, then what, what are the requirements that I need to put in there that will allow for that? Yeah. Is that what you're talking in, in, about? In many ways, I think that that might be, you know, yeah, I do, I come from a pretty DIY background in theater, like, first of all, as I said, you know, whiteboard operator, you know, just me and my friends doing theater, and when you want to start being, like, be a board theater in a really big place, like, there's a level of what is called professionalism, which requires, you know, things happening in a way, but to get there, there's a sort of mid-range where if stuff's really too hard, the chances that it'll be done well are really, really yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. It's interesting. I, I was part of Pi Fire for many years and sort of known for doing, like you just said, like totally unproducible things. And so we are, are attracted and attract a certain type of writer yeah. because of that. Right. And so it's like, oh, we found you found your home and we found you, you know, like you sort of you, you migrate towards the people who want to produce the unproducible or, or whatever it is. There's a certain group of people that end up being collaborators on that because of that. I mean, I've found that sometimes having less resource and less money makes it better. I can't believe I'm saying that, but like, I mean, I because it's true. well, it's true because it simplifies the problem in a way uh, that if there's only this many solutions to it, then that that's what we're going to do. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, design is certainly problem solving and producing a certain problem solving, but it seems to be much more creative when, you know, or, or, or if you think you have these five solutions, all of a sudden there's more of them because you have to think them up. You know what I mean? It just, it requires a different creative mind. 
which is not good. It's interesting, it's created in a different way than perhaps the visual thing that I've been talking about too. It's, just, it's two parts of the same way. So, I, I would say uh, from a producer's perspective, uh -huh. at a small budget, I will say like I'm, I look at plays and, and do think, can I produce this well for twenty thousand sure. dollars? And and so the answer is often no, and not no because it's asking for sort of crazy magical things. That stuff is easier to do in a lot of ways with a small budget. But you know, it's like you know George's play where I need the baby grand piano, and it's like, well, maybe I come up with a theatrical solution to not having the baby grand piano, but that might for me feel like I'm not really serving the play then, and then that therefore it doesn't feel like a play that I could do well. And I feel like people with a $400,000 budget, look at scripts and they could look at the same script and think they couldn't do it well, but for very different reasons that, that they're, but I mean, that, I think that is, you know, that is a real question, but I don't know, and, and I I do feel like that's something, that's when I read plays with clerics, think about the very degrees, you know, I, I, I do feel like. I think it was a grand piano arrangement. Oh. <laughs> 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 and somebody brought that up, right? <laughs> Baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you put in if, if you have to use an upright. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the problems when they talk about how they used to have an upright, so it cannot, it kind of does have to be. But please, no keyboards. Casio. <laughs> Casio. No Casio. Casio, right? Casio. <laughs> situations where, um, you know, in a theater with, with lots and lots of money, where we had, did a DIY, 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 uh, yeah. I, it, it, DIY. <laughs> you know, I had to really think that one through, and my staff were all laughing at me, and it's like, oh yeah, do it yourself. Okay, so, you know, that's how we started. We started teeny me in those space, and the, and the play moved on and, and got a big production at a very large regional theater, and several of them, actually. And that, so at that point, I, it, it was interesting to go back to my original uh, uh, thought, you know, about it. My the things that I had imagined that I had gone, eh, no budget, eh, can't do that, eh, you know, and bring that into the conversation, and then be questioned, like, why are you adding this? Is it just because you have lots of money? Right. <laughs> well, and that was interesting. That was interesting, you know. Uh, to go through that process, uh, but it was actually because uh, I had always imagined it, and some of it worked, and some of it. Yeah. But actually, that's really funny. That reminds me of something I just did last month, which is um, I opened the show in New York, and it's a musical, and it's a, a show called Flambe Dreams. And it's like about What's it called? Flambe Dreams, and it's literally <laughs> about fire. Like, it's all about fire. And it's a, there are songs called Desserts on Fire, where we, they run around with desserts on fire, and they sing about the fact that they have these desserts on fire. And somebody dies in a flaming bananas foster accident. It's just, it's, it's just like, it is, it is truly about fire. And I read it, and it was hilarious, and all this stuff. And then, the, and I don't know anything about New York theater, really, because this is the first show I'm going to do there. And I meet with the director, and I was like, oh, we're going to talk about all these like magic tricks and there's going to be flame and you're like, I don't know, in my mind that's what I thought. And the first thing he said to me was, there's no, you're not allowed to have any flame whatsoever on stage at all. <laughs> you just can't, like it's, it's illegal, you cannot do it. Even if you fire through the whole theater, like it's not going to happen. And so then we had to come up with this solution and it ended up being pop-up book 
plays. And actually, which really fit the spirit of the play. Like, it ended up serving the play so well. Like, and, and now we're talking about it moving to this other venue, because it's probably going to have another life. And we all agree that it's going to be, like, we're, there will not be fire. Like, it's so perfect. And we want, and we found the solution that's going to work, no matter maybe how big it gets. I mean, the flames might be bigger. But yeah, the, the, the spirit and the idea was born out of a, a, sort of a restriction, what was a perceived restriction, that ended up really doing something great with play. So it's an interesting thing to question as you know, it gets larger, or it evolves, or it's in this different circumstance. Like, you know, it, the first time we did it, did we really do it the way, you know, that best serves the play? And that's not always true that we do, but it's an interesting question to ask. I actually get more concerned about my plays being over design than under design. Yeah. I'm way more concerned about them being kind of underneath design concepts and things right. that don't really support you. Well, like concepts, like what you were saying, you know, that thing that I learned at that really crucial moment with Eurydice is that imposing your idea upon play. I never thought about my ideas as imposing upon play, and sometimes they do. And you have to be really careful about that. Mm -hmm. I think it's something you see all the time, particularly with, with with what you were talking about earlier, classical production, where someone will do a production yes. of Shakespeare. Like on Mars. And the, yeah, and like and the, the, the part that's on Mars fits really well with two thirds of the play. And then you're like, okay, but what about that other third? Of the play? And, and, and they're wearing revelators, and it's like, no. And I, to me, that's the thing about you know, the design, the design concept. So then maybe, maybe then, then, then you're right. Like it's why treat it differently. Why treat? Why should my mind think differently about a new play than a Shakespeare play? Sure. And I, I don't think it has. I think maybe that's that is like my my brain has evolved in that way, like in the way that I think. It's not about the concept. Well, it's something that can hold the whole play. What's that? Something that can hold the entire play right. and not just. There was a, uh, an onion uh, onion article. Once a radical theater director decides to set Merchant of Venice in Venice. Can't be done. Can't be done. Can't be done. And he, he was, they were interviewing the director, and he's talking about all the clues that seem to be this being set in Venice. Uh, and, and kind of during a certain time period, too. <laughs> Too crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Or comments? Or, yeah. I'm curious how working with designers has affected the way you view your plays and the way that you write them. Like, what has that changed for you? I'm really, really, really non prescriptive about most things, with the exception of I have a thing about sound. I'm just kind of, it's just something that is important to me. And I guess I'm just maybe more of a moral than a visual person or something. But I tend to, if there's going to be a soundscape, it tends to be really specific and really crafted in my place. And that's partially because I know what's possible with sound and that excites me. And sound doesn't have me, it's sound. It's not, oh, we don't have enough wood for this wall. Like, it's sound. So it's a little more, <laughs> whereas I don't really have a whole lot of insight into what it's going to take to do a lot. So I don't, I don't, I don't prescribe lights, I don't prescribe set, but sound, I get a little obsessed with that. And I'm a word, so, you know, word, sound, what you hear is what I care a lot about. If you're working with designers, I've got a tremendous amount of script. So I'm just annoying. I've, I've learned my job is to give them a sense of what this world might be so that somebody like Molly can go up and start like that and these stupid shadows in my head, right? <laughs> <laughs> it really is like that they're going to they're gonna do a better job of it, but they will, they will visually know what's possible. They will be a broader palette than I will. So, so really it's about just giving them a fair a, a, a sense and then writing stage directions for stuff that is actually really critical for the plot right? or being willing to change it completely if there's some better idea that comes from the time. Yeah, I think, I think it's about being open and then when you actually go to these premieres, like just being open to what their interpretation of it might be, um, except where maybe it might be your story. <laughs> <laughs> Does that happen to you? Without, you don't have to be specific. Yeah. Just, 
You can tell a tale. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell a tale without being specific. Yeah. I, I think I think instances where like the thing becomes too important or the play yeah. seems to stop so that we can like slowly watch this thing move across the stage <laughs> and we like reveal the costume as opposed to like just continuing with the pace. It's usually in the realm of adults. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm really prescriptive about what needs to happen, but I'm not about what and how it happens or how you can. But yeah, I mean, I guess it's what Aaron's saying. I'm really prescriptive, prescriptive in stage directions about specific actions and specific tone, um, but not how. Yeah, I think. Yeah, as I mentioned, that less and less. I think. I think it's about letting that air in. I think my older work was a little more airtight as far as uh, maybe what needed to happen or what, even even like actors, you know, a lot of parentheses, you know, we were talking about this the other day, you know, angrily or, you know, uh, uh, whatever. I mean, that's definitely, uh, you know, gone out the window as much as I can. Um, just to invite collaboration. I mean, there was a point, in, yeah, in my writing where I was like, oh, okay, I need to open this up. Like it's not um, that there needs to be an invitation, um, as you were talking about with your uh, bird effect. Uh, yeah, yeah. And Elton's great. Right? There's a there's a song in there, and then uh, when it was published, they really wanted me to okay, okay, what's the melody? And I'm like, well, there really isn't one. That's up to the production to make their own. Um, uh, and and that's been one of the most fun parts about seeing different productions is just hearing what they do with this song, because it does kind of shape the whole evening, because um, it does start the play. Um, and I think something like that really does, as you were saying, give ownership to the production. Um, and then as Lauren said, I think the only danger, though, then is is if in the storytelling. I feel like uh, you hope that you hope that people uh, don't just get excited about, about the design Possibilities, but also, but also, really look at oh, okay, well, what is this calling for, um, and and you know at least settling on that kind of guideline um, that what what is the script calling for, um, and, and spending enough time with that to uh, make sure that it makes sense. Um, sometimes choices get made that make <laughs> perhaps not as much sense. That's <laughs> one problem. And I will leave. <laughs> I was, can, can I ask Erin yeah. how you came up with that? I loved that it was like a shower curtain, but it it became like a cornfield. Oh, and, the corn curtain. Yeah, the uh, corn curtain. Uh, how, how did you do that? Cause I, that, was, that was Bill. That so, was brilliant. So, I loved it. Yeah, I've worked very closely with Bill English, who's the artistic director at the uh, uh, SF Playhouse, uh, who's also a set designer. And I believe the first person you were discussing this was the first time he actually let anybody else design a set in his house. Wow. All right. And uh, no pressure, no pressure, yeah. And then A, A, he did design the set, and I think one of the reasons why he wanted to design the set was because it created such an interesting challenge of how we'd be able to do it in any order. But we, we went through lots and lots of discussion of what the cornfield might look like. So my head was going to be that somewhere off on the side of the thrust stage of the massive a thousand seat house where the play was going to be done, there would be this uh, permanent installation cornfield, right? And obviously that was not ever going to happen. Real, real uh, theater that actually really produced the play. So um, he, we spent a bunch of time thinking about, there was an initial idea that maybe off to the sides of the stage there would be uh, uh, brooms on tracks, and we would quickly get them in, and you'd see, and then just become a cornfield, and then they'd go out. So the sort of aesthetic of the play, the play starts with a children's pageant. So the idea was everything in the play sort of could feel children's pageant-y. Um, but we couldn't get the broom cord to work, so we ultimately uh, built, came up with this idea of sort of a, a gauzy uh, curtain that had corn paint on it, and we look at the light, because the light would always be sort of dim, because all the, the scenes were set at dusk. So it would be, you know, it would give you the sense of being out, sort of like mosquitoes in the home field. Uh, and this is actually, it worked really well for us, but it's also one of those stories of where, you know, you, you, you end up having terrible things happen, which is uh, the night of our press preview uh, off Broadway, the corn curtain got stuck. And the stage kids are sitting there like, <laughs> trying to get the corn curtain to move. And we're all like, <laughs> like dying every second. And then 
the unfortunate statement during the coming on the god mic, and like, ladies and gentlemen, we're fixing this, and just as she says that, Cork <laughs> gets unstuck and the play goes on. Oh. You know, it's like one of those things that happens in life. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a very nice uh, nice device to, to, to create a very different setting because we come in front of the stage in front of everything else. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it was great. So I think we have about two minutes. Okay. Yeah, well, I, what you guys are saying kind of sort of reminded me of um, the opposite of that, which is, you know, when I was first reading plays in high school, and you get the Samuel French version, and the first thing I would do was go to the back and look at the ground plan. <laughs> you know, of whatever the first production up was of, of it, because, like, that's what I was interested in, and, and then the, the, read the process. You know what I mean? Which is like, that's like what I would do before I read the play. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad, I mean, I'm at a point where I don't, I don't know if Samuel Friend still does that, or, like, I don't, re that's not at all, of course, how I read the play now, but I'm so glad that's not included, you know what I mean, because it just really colors your experience. And, and, like, when we did Octavio's play, I didn't, I didn't want to know what the, you know, when we talked about it, we were like, let, I don't want to talk, talk about the previous production of it, because it just colors your experience in a way that it, it doesn't have to, you know. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, it's, you know, today's playwrights. This is how we think of design in terms of how you approach it. And you know, in, in sort of in the past, it's sort of like actually literally drawn out for you in the back of the script, which is a completely just a very different paradigm in terms of how design is thought of. Or, you know, where our relationship has changed in terms of between playwrights and directors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's two of you. Thank you all for watching. That concludes our playwrights panel at the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, very good. Enjoy the, 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 the